Okay, now we'll hear from uh, Louis McKenna, who the Office of Naval Affairs. Just, just for the record, I'm glad that uh, our moderator didn't refer to us as the esteemed panel. <laughs> so, happily, I guess I'm glad to have you shown now. I guess about the beginning of it. I'm going to be coming to the gallery. I guess I've got the gallery in the cusp of the hour. Open now. Thanks very much, everyone, uh, for coming out tonight. And thanks for having us. Uh, very pleased to be here. My name is Lewis McKinnon, and I uh, work in the office of Gaelic Affairs. And uh, I have a few thoughts on, on what's uh, been presented uh, to us here this evening. And I, I chose to look at the I chose to look at the questions independently and, and try to answer them. Um, Give some, give some thought that, uh, that we can uh, consider here this evening. Um, what is the best and the most principled way for Highland societies to meet their original aims and of nourishing Highland tradition and language? And I think Dr. Newton uh, touched on this, but if we refer to, if we take the term Highland as being synonymous than Gaelic, as being synonymous with Gaelic, then it would seem that the best and most principled way for Highland societies to meet their original aims would be to develop and support programs that assist Gaelic language and cultural transmission in the constituencies they serve. And um, I think uh, most recently in the casket, Katrina Parsons, who's here this evening, had an article um, which referenced specifically the history of the Highland Society of Anakinish and its own connection and its own uh, attempts to support Gaelic uh, language specifically throughout its history. What role can tartan kilts and the spectacles of Highland Games play in this? If an authentic interpretation of, of these historic dress and rec recreational activities can be effectively communicated through information workshops, marketing messages, etc., then these may very well support the aims of Gaelic society. Authentic interpretation uh, might begin with information on clan tartan patterns. Uh, Dr. Uh, Newton referenced this earlier. There is no historical reference for Gales or non Gales the distinct target patterns according to which clan grouping you belong to. Empirical evidence informs us that this is a more recent historical phenomenon. And if anybody has read any of uh, John uh, Preble's work, they'll know from his account of uh, the Battle of Culloden that there was a situation where a soldier who had a kilt, who was adorned in a kilt, was lying on the field. And the only thing that distinguished those with kilts on uh, who were on the government forces from those with kilts on who were on the, uh, the side of uh, Prince Charles Edward Stuart and his forces uh, was, a, was a, a, a blue bonnet that they wore. And um, so this particular soldier was actually part of the Highland Army. And uh, when he was approached by a British soldier who, who was going about the field um, dealing with the, with the wounded by uh, doing away with them, um, this particular soldier put on the bonnet of the government army. And when the British soldier turned his back, he ran away. So it tells us that the British soldier who was engaged in that particular situation wasn't able to discern through uh, the color of the tartan what side uh, the, uh, the Highlanders were actually on. It is revealing also to go to native uh, Nova Scotia Gaelic speakers to ascertain the knowledge that Gaelic speakers themselves have of these particular aspects. When speaking with my father, who is here tonight, Kim and Ash you know, um, he was not aware that at least three different patterns of McKinnon tartan exist, which is our family name, nor was he aware of a clan motto that existed for clan McKinnon as a whole. In my view, and I think this, this, can, be, uh, this can be reinforced uh, uh, empirically, this does not indicate a gap or lack in my father's knowledge. It simply reflects the fact that in the Gaelic speech community of Nova Scotia, and my anecdotal sense is in Scotland as well, the kilt and symbolism and its nuances held little rel relevance in post Highland Clarence society. That Gaelic speaking clans, and in some cases non Gaelic speaking clans, wore the kilt is historical fact. However, in my personal experience, I've met many, many people who discussed their clan origins, what clan tartan they have, and war cries and mottos. And very few of these individuals use or speak Gaelic as a daily means of communicating, socializing, or living in Nova Scotia society. Many, many, 
in an extension of that, as many would most likely be astonished to know that the making of the kilt and the local dyes for pepper patterns were activities until the pressures of Anglicization in Gaelic Scotland, commencing in the late Middle Ages, done completely through the medium of, were done completely through the medium of Gaelic. So such words that are common around Highland Games and, and other types of events um, that are associated with Scottish societies, such as Taylor Bake, Gillibrobes, uh, Spot and Skin Do, are all Gaelic. <coughs> Local dyes provided the patterns in this craft and the Gaelic language surrounding to it, to my knowledge, has gone out of use. And just a, a, another point that I find interesting is that um, the fact that many families who wore the kilt um, historically were Anglo Normans that came in with William the Conqueror and migrated uh, into areas uh, in Scotland. Um, and the Gael uh, Gaelic speakers Gaelicized their names. And some of these are Gramdi, Gremi, Chisowi, Frishowi, Kremini, Gawardini, um, Grants. Grahams, Chisholms, Frasers, Cummins, or Cummings, and Gordons. Indeed, many of these and many of these Anglo-Norman families went native and adopted local Gaelic language and culture, following and following and following the political and military upheaval of Highland society in the late 17th and 18th centuries, ended up immigrating to places like Nova Scotia. Gaelic society celebrated its heroes and acknowledged feats of strength and endurance. We know through such publications as Oitis, I guess, Irish, Psalms Remembered in Exile, and Charles Dunn, Charles, Charles Dunn's The Highland Settler, what physical feat scales participated in, such physically challenging activities such as the salmon leap and barrel jump. Activities such as the hammer toss, the hay toss, the, the caber toss appear to be more recent inventions that do not have, have historical basis in Gaelic culture. There are simple kids games and adult games that are cited by Gaelic tradition bearers as being part of authentic Gaelic games. These are based in Gaelic language and less Thai language and culture together. Do these things actually increase the understanding and awareness of authentic Highland culture or, or propagate misrepresentations? It would seem that there are misrepresentations when it comes to understanding and, and awareness of authentic Gaelic culture, and, and Dr. Newton referred to these extensively. Certainly in the local Gaelic Nova Scotia context, it seems that a disconnect exists between target and kilt organizations and Highland Games and, specific, and specifically tradition bearers in the emerging Gaelic speech community. Do they enrich local communities in any substantial and sustaining way? Certainly events that focus on target kilts and Highland Games and succeed in bringing individuals and groups together facilitate connecting individuals within a given society. If this is the objective of the group or greater collective, then success will be measured in terms of achieving objectives. If the objective is to facilitate the further development of a Gaelic speech community through culture, then an authentic Gaelic cultural well needs to be accessed. Storytelling, songs, traditional fiddle and pipe tunes, customs, foods can be better appreciated and cultural skills enhanced by speaking directly with a tradition bearer or listening to the recorded speech of a Gaelic tradition bearer. If the objective is to develop a speech community that is intimately aware of its rich tradition, then an approach that links learners and tradition bearers frequently has proven successful in other jurisdictions and is demonstrating results here in Nova Scotia. Identifying with and engaging in language activity presents opportunities to enable individuals and groups and communities. Enhancing self-identity, work, connection to place, this presents communities with the opportunity for self-determination based on their own group dynamics with great potential to richly influence and evolve the broader community.